Right, well, welcome to another session in season three of Black History Lunchtime Conversations. It may be lunchtime for some people, but other people in other parts of the world, it's breakfast time or supper time. But uh, it's good to see everyone. And um, we're going to make a start today um, to find out about an interesting time of British history when Haile Selassie, the emperor of Ethiopia, came to Britain under difficult circumstances, but he spent quite a time in Britain. And yet I find this is one of the black history stories that is very rarely told and not used to help children understand about those years before the Second World War, a very important time. Now we've got Helen Papworth with us and she has spent considerable time in Ethiopia, um, but also um, at this time agreed that she would research the life and times of, of Haile Selassie in the UK. And as we were preparing for the session, we realised that several people have got stories and memories to tell about Haile Selassie. So I think it's going to be a really interesting conversation <laughs> following up your input, Helen. So thanks very much indeed. Over to you, Helen. Thank you very much. I'll try sharing the screen now. Looking good. Looking good until I, oh dear, dear. One of the great things about these sessions is that we're all getting more confident or in some cases, in my case, <laughs> less confident with using Zoom. But, uh, you know, it's a new phenomenon for us. Let me just uh, close all these down and uh, hopefully I will get to the one that I needed. Right, that's smashing. My score. Are we nearly there? Just while you're getting the, the screen up, let you tell let me tell you. Oh, here we are. I'll keep my story about Haile Selassie. Not <laughs> that I met him, but it's a good story. All right. Here we are. Helen's a researcher and she's spoken to us before. Uh, um, she's also an author um, and her, her book, um, The Bumblebee and the Bee. <coughs> the Butterfly and the Bee, yes. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry about that. It's always, uh, it surprises me how difficult it is when you kind of think you've got it all set up and then suddenly you realise that it's not that straightforward. But uh, I am now on the first page. Just a little bit about the background. I, I went to Ethiopia 2004 as a BSO volunteer, uh, worked with the Ministry of Education, travelled the whole of the country uh, for two years uh, monitoring education, uh, but then went back a couple of years later and uh, uh, did all the editing for the civics and ethical education textbooks. And it was during that time, really, that I began to study more of the history as well as the, uh, the civic education of the country. Um, but uh, I, although I knew that Haile Selassie had come to the UK, um, I mean, even members of my family re recalled it, uh, I hadn't actually done any real study of that where, when I was actually in Ethiopia. When I returned to the UK, I became a trustee uh, and for a while the chair of the Anglo-Ethiopian Society. And Keith Bowers was, I think, one of the people that I might have been in touch with because I actually arranged a visit to Fairfield House, but didn't actually go myself. So I knew, you know, I, I was aware of things, but until uh, Liz asked me to you know, talk about Haile Selassie and his time in the UK, I'd not really studied it. So you have to excuse the fact that I am not an expert on this particular subject, but I'm learning fast and hopefully people can fill in the gaps as well. The uh, reason he came uh, was because of the Italian invading Ethiopia. The Italians had tried to invade Ethiopia in 1896, uh, but excuse me, <coughs> were defeated at the uh, Battle of Adwa. And, uh, and so Mussolini um, wanted to make sure that he had Ethiopia as well as Eritrea and Somaliland uh, to complete his part of um, the African continent. And so after an incident uh, in 1934 over land on the Somaliland and Ethiopian border, e uh, Italy 
really began to mobilize forces and started the uh, tactics that were to lead to the Battle of Mechu in 1936. And at that point, uh, the Ethiopians led by Haile Selassie withdrew to Addis Ababa. Uh, Haile Selassie realized that he couldn't, while he was living in Ethiopia, defeat the Italians. They were using chemical warfare. They were, you know, they, they were actually using chemical bombs and he himself had been affected by this. So his advisors on the whole decided that he really needed to leave the country uh, and approach the League of Nations of which uh, Ethiopia had long been a member. And so he took his family into exile and he uh, fled on the train as we've just been talking about to Djibouti uh, and then joined the ship HMS Enterprise which stopped up at Jerusalem and part of the royal family stayed there including his wife, the Empress Menen. However, Haile Selassie continued uh, with his entourage, including some of the family and uh, other supporters, uh, to Southampton. Interesting reading, uh, particularly in Keith Bauer's book, about his journey, because when he set off from Ethiopia, uh, he had a huge entourage and also wanted to take some of his lions because he kept lions in the uh, uh, capital in Addis Ababa in his palace. Uh, they didn't get beyond Djibouti. Which might... <laughs> um, when he actually arrived in Britain, he wasn't given an official welcome. There were quite a lot of people there. People knew he was going to arrive. Uh, one in particular was Sylvia Pankhurst, who we'll talk about later. Uh, but the government was very clear that he was not here by invitation. He was simply here to stay while things were sorted out. But when he arrived, he was actually um, setting off very quickly to go back onto the continent, uh, this time to Geneva, where he addressed the League of Nations in June 1936. When, he, uh, when Ethiopia was uh, signed up to the League of Nations, it was interesting that uh, although Italy supported them, Britain was one of the countries which was actually against uh, Ethiopia signing up. Um, when things went badly wrong for Ethi Ethiopia in 1935, France actually removed protection from Ethiopia and Britain wouldn't actually support e uh, Ethiopia's position. Uh, although they wouldn't give uh, Mussolini a free hand. Uh, they didn't actually support uh, uh, sending troops or anything else on their behalf into Ethiopia. So Ethiopia basically was left rather neglected and uh, with its, just its forces uh, that were left on the ground there. So Haile Selassie uh, arrives in Britain 1936 and he initially stays in London he moves to Malvern. I uh, know Liz live, uh, has uh, family or, li or had family living very close to where he, uh, he was living. Uh, he also stayed in a number of other places and visited many places in Britain. I was quite surprised. You know, he even came to Wales. Um, but uh, the, for a while, he also stayed in Bath. And it was while he was in Bath that he realised he quite liked the city. But he was also aware that his finances were running low. He brought um, uh, finances in the form of, of um, artifacts and so on that he could sell. Uh, and he had other forms of income, but actually staying in hotels across the country was proving to be far too expensive. So he decided to purchase somewhere and it was Bath that he returned to. Fairfield House was on the market and that became not only his home, but also the seat of the Ethiopian government between 1936 and 41. The picture on the right actually shows him in the window of the, of the um, house. Helen, we're having a problem seeing the PowerPoint. We can see the list where you, you've clicked, but um, can you go out and go back in again? We can just see your folder. Sorry about that. I think Absolutely, you, yes, 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 let me just get to... Uh, yeah, I, I think you probably clicked share active window rather than share screen. So we're only seeing. OK. So. No, I've got I'm it says here I'm share. Uh, sorry, I'm screen sharing. Mm -hmm. So you if might I want to just stop and then yes. try again and make sure when you click. Look at the different options.
and just yeah. You can see that? Yes, yeah, now we can see it. Yeah. Okay. Great. <laughs> so we'll just whiz through from the beginning again. That's lovely. No, it's still not asking me. Hold on a second, I'll do it again. Stop share. We get good at this with practice. <laughs> Oh, hello, Richard. Good to you joining us. I can ask, can people see this, the full screen or not? No. No. Oh, it. this is really... The share screen. Good. We saw it briefly just when you started just now. Yeah. Go Good. back into share screen because we saw it oh, just whatever now. Whatever you did, yeah. just do it again. Yes. Unfortunately, I've just closed it. Let me just, oh dear. That's fine, Richard. He's, you're just going to listen in. That's great. <laughs> has Simon got the copy of the PowerPoint as he well? He has, yes, yes. Sh shall I try and put it? Could you? Yeah. I, I can tell you when to go onto the next uh, slide, if that's okay. Sorry about this. Okay, you need to, yeah, you need to come out of... Um... Stop scare, okay. Yeah. Let All right, me... well, while Simon's just setting that up then, and um, we can go through from the beginning again, uh -huh. I think it's going to be quite quick, so yeah. that's good. Okay. Yeah. Great. Right. We go on to the next screen. All right, so back to the beginning. Yeah, these are just the uh, the other uh, screens about uh, the um, invasion of Ethiopia in 1936. The next slide. Um, for some reason, doesn't matter. Move on to the next. Um, and again, the picture seems to be <laughs> missing. <laughs> You know why that that um all oh, right this is good then no idea why that happens no can we go on to the next uh, slide simon yeah uh let me just try and call it up again if it's playing up just a second yeah yeah mm. um strange isn't it yes yeah it looks like they haven't all come through yeah no that's, that's yeah. opening it Direct. No, never mind. Yeah, the talk is, I mean, the, the pictures were just there to, you know, to give me hints and that. So uh, moving on to the uh, the next slide. Um, how he paid. Uh, I, I, there's actually a quote here from his own um, uh, journal, his own diary. He wrote his autobiography in Amharic, his, uh, his first language, while he was actually staying in Britain. That was one of the things that he did in his spare time. And uh, it, it was clear that, you know, he, even when he purchased uh, the house, he was left in very uh, difficult circumstances financially. Um, we know that he had his crown safely secured um, uh, uh, um, in a safe place, but um, he was relying, like I say, on selling artifacts in order to be able to survive or relying even on support from other people. Um, but uh, he, he also was trying to support the other exiles that had had to leave the country. Next slide, please. Uh, his uh, family lived with him. His wife uh, returned from Jerusalem uh, for a while. Uh, she didn't like the cold of Britain and I know she returned to Jerusalem at some time. But the uh, children of Haile Selassie uh, on the whole lived with him and also their children. Uh, Crown Prince Aswathan, um, they had a daughter born in 1936 in uh, northern Ethiopia. Uh, Princess uh, Teganya Walk, her husband um, actually died in Ethiopia. He was uh, executed in Ethiopia, but she had her children. And the uh, Princess Aida and her three sisters were actually educated in Clarendon School in Malvern. Uh, Princess Sahai, um, she was uh, studied to be a nurse at Great Ormond Street. Uh, and then the younger princes, Prince McConnell and Prince Ali Selassie, uh, were also living uh, in Fairfield House um, and then went to boarding school. And apparently, you know, they, by the time they went to boarding school, they were speaking perfect English. 
Uh, as I said, Haile Selassie's lost close family members. Uh, both his sons-in-laws were executed by the Italians and his eldest daughter to a previous wife uh, was captured with her children and she died in Italy in 1941. Mm-hmm. So he suffered some, you know, quite uh, periods of grief. Um, onto the next slide, please. And uh, although these pictures haven't shown, uh, they were just from the newspapers in Bath, uh, because when he actually got into doing visits again, he would visit places like the Roman Baths, he visited the garden party. Next slide, these won't show either. Helped judge a dog show, visited uh, Fry's Chocolate Factory with his wife and daughter. And it's uh, believed that he also visited, he likes swimming, and so went to visit uh, Western Supermare, uh, swam in the Lido on numerous occasions. Next slide. Uh, while he was in Bath, he uh, managed the affairs with uh, his assistants, his advisors. Uh, and these advisors included his foreign minister, Heru. He had an aide, a personal aide called Lorenzo Tezaz, private secretary, Walder Georgis, Walder Johannes, and his closest advisor, who was his cousin, was uh, Raskasa. <coughs> so they were actually looking at how they could manage things in Ethiopia, even though they were distant from there, they were obviously getting information from there. And one of the pieces of information that came out in 1937, on the 19th of February, was a plot to kill Graziani, who was the Italian high commander. Now that plot failed, although Graziani was injured, but Graziani then decided that in retribution, he would arrest, have the, or arrange for the arrest and executions of citizens of Ethiopia, because he never actually caught the two people who were responsible in the first case. So not only were they arresting people and executing them in, uh, in the capital, but they also went to a monastery to the north of uh, Addis Ababa, where they believed uh, the, the two people responsible had uh, been for a while. And they executed virtually the whole of uh, the uh, community in that monastery. Graziani was nicknamed the Butcher of Ethiopia, and Haile Selassie was grief stricken at the impact it had on his country, particularly because he was probably aware of the plot and may have partly been responsible, according to Keith Bowers. It was in that same year that his son in law, Rastesta, was executed, and uh, uh, by then, Things were not happening well in, over in Ethiopia. E- Ethiopian resilience had virtually stopped. Next slide, please. But Haile Selassie continued with his engagements in Britain. He, um, in January uh, 1938, with his uh, daughter, Princess Tenanyawak, who by then was a widow, he visited Bishop's Castle in Shropshire. I heard about this from a friend uh, hiding in Ethiopia. She married an Ethiopian, but her family came from Shropshire and she wrote an article for the um, Anglo-Ethiopian Society about that visit uh, because people in Shropshire, particularly in Bishop's Castle, well remembered the uh, emperor visiting. Um, And he he had other friends in Britain. He was friends with Sir Sidney Bart and and his wife uh, who had lived in British Embassy in Ethiopia. Charles Steer was a journalist in Ethiopia, and he actually became uh, the husband of uh, Sydney and his wife's daughter. Another famous figure, Wilfred Thesiger, who was born in Addis Ababa, um, lived in Shropshire near Knighton. And while um, Haile Selassie was over in Britain, he was invited to his home in the um, village uh, near Knighton. Next slide, please. Sylvia Pankhurst, I mentioned before, she'd actually um, been an opposer of fascism in Italy since the 1920s. Her husband um, was Italian, but he'd fled Italy. And uh, so she had supported um, uh, Ethiopia ever since the Walwal incident. She offered her services uh, to the Ethiopian representative in London, Dr. Charles Martin. He had a very interesting background because he had been discovered in Ethiopia as a toddler 
on the hills uh, above um, the, the area where there had been a, an, um, a war with Ethiopia and the British back in 1868. And uh, that was um, a battle in order to release hostages, which the emperor at the time had taken, Emperor Theodros. And apparently this child, uh, who was renamed Charles Martin, uh, was the son of the two hostages, uh, his parents. And he was taken by two British soldiers back to India and renamed after them, that one was called Charles, one was called Martin. He went on to study medicine and then he returned to Ethiopia. And he worked for uh, uh, the um, empress um, and then worked for Haile Selassie. Um, and he had a name uh, in Ethiopian, which said, you know, was his, um, his, you know, his Ethiopian name. But in Britain, he was known as Dr. Charles Martin. He worked with Sylvia Pankhurst and uh, encouraged her to found a newspaper, which was called New Times and Ethiopia Times. She too visited Haile Selassie in Bath, and eventually she moved to Ethiopia with her son, Richard, in 1956. And Richard Pankhurst became very well known in Ethiopia. He died recently, um, but uh, this is one of the books that he wrote uh, about his mother and her work in Ethiopia. Sylvia Pankhurst was the daughter of uh, an English suffragette, Christopher Pankhurst. Uh, so the Pankhurst name uh, was very famous anyway. Um, but I worked with Richard's son, um, Alula Pankhurst, while I was working in Ethiopia. Um, as among his other skills, he was a children's book uh, author. Next slide, please. Uh, unfortunately, we haven't got the picture of Roger Gray, um, who um, uh, Haile Selassie met in Dunham Massey. Uh, but the other picture is uh, the Labour peer, Donald Soper, who was also a pacifist campaigner. Next, next slide. Uh, Chamberlain um, didn't actually support um, Ethiopia, um, at, you know, throughout his um, time as prime minister. And uh, he actually recognized the Italian occup occupation. However, uh, when Britain declared war on Germany um, and uh, eventually Churchill took over as the prime minister, the Italians under Mussolini declared war on the Allies. And at that time, the British decided that, yes, they would fight this common enemy. Meanwhile, Lorenzo, um, uh, who was uh, Haile Selassie's uh, aide, had returned to Ethiopia on a secret mission to find out whether there would be support for Haile Selassie returning, and there was strong support. So the British helped um, Haile Selassie return uh, with some supporters, and he exited under a pseudonym, Mr. Strong, and returned to the Sudan. Next slide, please. And there he worked particularly with uh, two uh, English uh, soldiers, um, Wingate and Sanford, who are pictured there with Haile Selassie in April 1941. Colonel Wingate headed up what they call the Gideon Force, and they coordinated an effort with British soldiers and with Ethiopian soldiers, um, with the Haile Selassie issuing proclamations, and then also joining in the war uh, have, uh, with his sons at his side, uh, two of his sons at his side and eventually that force defeated the Italians. Next slide, please. And so Haile Selassie returned to Ethiopia, to Addis Ababa in, uh, on May, 1941. And that was the exact date, four years earlier, uh, sorry, uh, six years earlier, when he had actually had to leave, when the, uh, when the uh, Italians had entered Addis Ababa. Next slide. So the legacy for the UK, obviously um, one uh, legacy was actually the awareness of fascism and, and that increased due to the support of people like Sylvie Pankhurst. The relationships between Ethiopia and uh, the UK continued. I'm sorry we haven't got this picture, but uh, Queen Elizabeth actually visited the country in 1965. And um, Haile Selassie returned to um, Britain in 1954 
1958, he donated Fairfield House to the British to Bath. Next slide, please. One um, legacy of his stay um, in the UK for the people of Ethiopia was education, because uh, during um, his time as the emperor, he made sure that education, particularly um, secondary education, was done through the medium of English. And there were many people, uh, volunteers like um, VSO volunteers, uh, as well as um, um, American peacekeepers who helped uh, develop the education in Ethiopia uh, following a period when um, many of their own um, experts had been killed by the Italians. The syllabus teaching materials um, were also based on uh, the English education system. So it had a big impact on Ethiopia, but probably the biggest impact that his legacy had was the support of Britain in terms of you know, um, freeing uh, Ethiopia of the Italians. Although many did stay, one of the things that, uh, that Haile Selassie did was that he, he basically pardoned many of the Italians that were there at the time. Uh, he needed their workforce. And so the Italians, many of the Italians stayed and they built roads. There's a, a famous road to the north of Addis Ababa uh, to, um, towards Desi in the north, which we actually call the Italian road because it, it was built by the Italians and they also constructed a tunnel there. Uh, they left uh, legacies in terms of street names, Piazza, uh, Kazanches, and they left fantastic pizza and, uh, you know, uh, pasta dishes and macchiato. You can get some of the best coffee in Ethiopia, local coffee, but the Italian way of, of serving it. I think that's the last slide, Simon. Yep. Wow, that was fantastic. Okay. Indeed. Okay. Um, I'm really sorry about that. I thought I'd had everything prepared and then it didn't work for you, but uh, hopefully you've understood it. Like I say, the pictures were just a kind of a reminder to me. <laughs> well, I think this is really interesting because I think one of the ways forward for us when we've got our uh, resources website set up, which is going to be called Unlocking Black History, is that it would be good to work together as small teams to do special presentations. And what I've heard before we started this was that several people have got um, stories about Haile Selassie and we might be able to pull together a working group which would really you know, help to enhance the story and make it a really useful resource because that's such a, a fascinating uh, basis. So what I'm going to ask you to do now, which I don't usually do, is if you want to add a little bit about your... Um, your experience or knowledge or insights into the life of Haile Selassie, um, press reactions and then you can see that you can raise your hand, like I demonstrated. I will now remove my hand. Um, so <laughs> who are we going to start with then? Okay, who was telling me stories beforehand? Martin, you were saying that you... Oh uh, yes. Uh... <coughs> I'm interested in uh, Ethiopia and I've been there three times, but my main experience was across the border in Somalia and I was involved with refugees. So I was looking also at refugee camps uh, in Ethiopia that had Somalis. Uh, so I, I'm interested in the country. I know a little bit about the history of uh, Haile Selassie, but not as a historian. I, I've read uh, the book uh, by the Polish author Mm -hmm. uh, called the emperor, uh, was a Polish journalist who admitted later in his life that he'd lied a little bit and made a few things up uh, in this book, The Emperor. So I'd be happy to join a working group, but really as an enthusiast to uh, thank Helen and others for their interest rather than having a lot of information. But I do have quite a few books on Ethiopia, although Helen's probably got far more than me. So. I'm interested in joining a working group, but I'd be uh, very uh, secondary. Can I just say that um, Liz and I discussed this book, The Emperor, the other day, um, because it, it does tell a very different story to Haile Selassie. 
uh, to the story you know told by people uh, like Keith Bowers and uh, I mean there's another book um, uh, the Negus um, which yeah. is uh, written by Angelo uh, del Boga um, an Italian and and these books are very complimentary but uh, I think uh, you know <laughs> I can't even pronounce his name, but I was fascinated when I read the book, uh, The Emperor. <laughs> Kapuczynski. Um, yeah. yeah. Kapuczynski. So um, oh. this was lent to me by Levi Lawrence here in, in Melbourne. And uh, he's spent time living in Ethiopia. And I think he'd probably like to be in the, the working group as well. Um, he comes from the UK originally. Um, so were you saying that this is uh, not an accurate representation or that it's an alternative representation? No, it, well, the journalist was a bit like Boris Johnson, our prime minister. Uh, <laughs> you know, he, he, he was allowed himself a bit of latitude. So right. Kapunsky uh, admitted after he'd written it that he, he'd lied a little bit or made convenient links that weren't necessarily 100% true. But it's a very entertaining book, you know, <laughs> talking about the... Uh, Hylas Celeste's little dogs that uh, u urinating on people. They were allowed to urinate on some, which was considered a privilege to the recipient receiving the urine. But in others, it, it was, you know, clearly not on. And it talks about, you know, there was a, an official in the uh, regal room that would carry cushions because the, the, the king, uh, the emperor, was rather short and occasionally needed to sit higher up on the chair. So anyway, Helen knows more, a lot more about this than I do. Thank you. I was just interested to ask that question about the book. John, thank you very much for putting your hand up. <laughs> now get your speaker I think on. I you're muted, yes. <laughs> OK. Uh, yeah, that, Helen, that was fantastic. I've just been looking, though, at um, Pan-Africanism as a topic. And Haile Selassie comes into that. And I've just got a whole mass of people, which I want to do, actually. I want to get a, an idea that we're not just talking about one person, we're talking about movement. But at the same time, it's only when you start looking at the detail and people become humanised again, which, again, something I'm hoping that we can do, that it makes sense. So looking at Haile Selassie in this way, the stories I hear about Haile Selassie coming to Britain, he got off the aeroplane and there were so many people there that he, he was rather frightened by, I, th I think. Um, that's the story I hear, right? but I don't get, I haven't had the, the information. So I, I've just been finding out about people I've never heard of, somebody like Anna Cooper, I've, Anna Hay Julia Hayward Cooper, who was uh, under this title. And once you look into them, they're not just people, a slave, like a slave packed into a ship or something like that. They become human beings who uh, dimensions uh, to them. So this is part of it. But in the Pan-African context, of course, the links, um, Marcus Garvey, and there's a lot of significance in, in Ethiopia in that respect. Um, so that's something I've been looking at. But I mean, this information and understanding, I, I think, is invaluable and very, very important. Thank you. Can I just say that um, one of the things that Ethiopia will continue to claim um, is that it was never colonized and it doesn't believe that it was ever fully colonized by the Italians. So it, it claims that, you know, it is, the, apart from I think Liberia, it is the only African country which was never colonized. And it's incredibly proud of that fact. And, and other African nations look to Ethiopia. And I think that's one of the reasons why, you know, they're, they're proud to have the, uh, the African Union there and so on. That, it, you know, it, it stood up to the rest of the world. It stood up to the Western world, to, you know, to Europe. Um, and, I'm, and, you know, I'm sure, you know, Haile Selassie was, partly responsible for making sure that uh, Ethiopia was seen as probably, um, you know, equal to any other country in the world, which was why, you know, he felt that, you know, should join the League of Nations. And, uh, you know, I, I, so he has, a, I mean, he has a lot of critics, does Haile Selassie, but I think he has an awful lot going for him. He, he was very, very forward thinking. And I think one of the legacies of his time in Britain was that, you know, he, he understood 
you know, things. He, he got to, you know, visit factories and so on. He, he moved Ethiopia on a great deal. It was just sad that by the time, you know, um, 1974, uh, when the DEG took over, uh, and the, obviously the bad famines and so on, um, and, uh, you know, his family were put in prison and, uh, you know, people were killed and so on, and he lost his own life. Uh, that from that time, that there was a legacy that, you know, people said, well, you know, he was partly responsible for not looking after them. But I, I think, I, I, you know, I think he has a lot that, you know, we, we should be, you know, we should praise him for. It's so important we understand that. Yeah. Thank, mm. you. Thank you very much. Well, if I can just add a little bit, because... Um, I have spent quite a lot of time with Yasser Safari and other Rastas. We did a project called The Roots and Development of Rastafari in the West Midlands. The Heritage Lottery Fund supported us to do that. Um, but it's quite some years ago now and uh, we, the, the resources have been dispersed. But one of the things that we did was to look at the time that Haile Selassie was, was in England. So. The story that you tell, John, about Haile Selassie being overwhelmed by crowds at the airport was in Jamaica, when he went to Jamaica. Oh, right. Yes. And that was a moment when apparently it was a very grey day, but suddenly the clouds came open and the sun shone and down came the plane with Haile Selassie and the crowds mobbed the plane. I think that's correct to say. And there was some apprehension, apprehension at that point. But when he came into Britain, as, as you say, he came, um, he came on the ship, the HMS Enterprise, and then by train. And there's Pathé news footage of him being given a most fantastic welcome by English people, even though the British government weren't necessarily supporting him. The British people were really pleased to see him. So that, that was interesting. And then um, after trying to get um, various audiences with the government and find this, their support and where were they going to, to house him, he decided that perhaps it seems a little further away to be in Bath at Fairfield House would be more appropriate. And so he made that his base. And I've spent many hours in Fairfield House because it uh, was given to um, Bath City Council and they use it as an elderly people's um, day centre for people from the um, African and Caribbean community. Um, so we, we would meet with those people, but also um, the Rastafarians that had a, a base there as well. So I'm not quite sure what's happening, but I can certainly find out more about what's happening with Fairfield House. Um, but my interesting bit of the story, I think, is uh, that we went to Dunham Massey, which is a, um, a property um, near to Manchester. And Lord Stanford was um, in charge of, it was his estate. And I think he was called William Gray, wasn't he then, Helen? Yeah. So Lord Stanford invited Haile Selassie at the time when um, Haile Selassie was finding that his finances were really an issue. And we actually researched into, the, um, into Hansard and read the reports where Haile Selassie is discussed and his position is discussed. But nowhere does it actually say how his finances were sorted out. But when I read this book, I realized that one of the things that Haile Selassie did in his everyday life in Ethiopia, the court, was that he walked a lot and talked with people as he walked. And uh, Lord Stanford writes in his diary that he and Haile Selassie walked in the gardens. And that wouldn't have been a walk just for fun. It would have been a walk for a purpose. And um, when we put together the time frame of the comments in Hansard, the time of his visit in, um, at, to Dunham Massey, it really coincided. So it looks as if it was Lord Stanford who very much revered His Imperial Majesty Haile Selassie. Um, 
he was the, the benefactor who supported him, but he did it very discreetly. Now, Lord Stanford was member of the League of Nations in um, the area of, of Dunham Massey. I don't know where the nearest village was, but there uh, were a lot of people there who supported him. Sorry? Sorry, the village is Altrium near Durham Massey. Altrium, Altrium yeah. yeah. So, um, so that was one thing. Now, there was another League of Nations um, activist. You mentioned Ernest Stevens in the West Midlands. Well, he was in Stourbridge and his wife and himself were philanthropists. They supported Haile Selassie in his work. And so they invited Haile Selassie to stay with them in their beautiful home in Blakedown, Worcestershire. And that's where I grew up as a little girl. So we always knew that in our village, the emperor of Ethiopia had stayed and people would tell you stories about him going there. Um, and he would take his children. Some of the girls, as you say, were at, uh, in Malvern at the schools there. And also the story of um, Bishop's Castle, was it? I think that story was told by Benjamin Zephaniah as well when he did a film about Haile Selassie. So um, Mer apparently Haile Selassie's children, as they grew visit on visit on one of the door frames, there are notches to say how tall the children were growing. But the family who had the house when we were doing the research um, weren't particularly interested in us investigating that. <laughs> Probably painted it over. Um, but it, it's an interesting story. So I, I feel that the story about Lord Stanford, who then went on to fly the Ethiopian flag on Haile Selassie's birthday every year. And um, the Rastas in uh, Manchester uh, approached the National Trust, they own Dunham Massey now, and they asked if. Um, this tradition could be continued and we were actually there when the Ethiopian flag was flown once again over Dunham Massey. So that was a, a really fantastic uh, time. And my only other little bit of information is that I was with Caroline one time watching D uh, Downton Abbey, which is a, a great favourite <laughs> favorite of ours when I was staying with her, um, when suddenly the story of the arrival of Haile Selassie came up and that described how um, one of the characters was saying how difficult it was. He had responsibility to try and find somewhere for Haile Selassie to stay, but that the government didn't really want to, to, to support him over much. So yes, so they're uh, all interesting little snippets that I can recall from this, these fascinating months of, of touring around Britain, finding places that Haile Selassie had been to, and uh, and seeing it as well from the Rasta's point of view that they're so respectful of uh, of the fact that uh, he was the last um, great leader in Africa as they they saw it with. Ethiopia's independence and of course he went on to Haile Selassie went on to um, give uh, the, the land in Shashamani to um, uh, any Rastafarians who wanted to return back to Africa and there are many stories about that. I hope that Levi Lawrence will join us one time because he's been to Shashamani and Yasser Safari has as well so we'd be able to hear further stories there from from that perspective. But uh, thank you very much indeed, Helen, for, for pulling that together and, and giving us a start to uh, what I could see as being a really useful project. Because as you say, Martin, it's an important story and it's not a story that's very often um, used as a, a, an example of, of our, our shared history, our links in black history. So, um, Helen, thank you. I'm fascinated. Liz, I'd, like to, I'd like to make a comment before you go, before yes. Helen goes. Can I do that now? Yes, yes. Yeah. Can I say, I've never met uh, Earl Selassie, but I know there's mixed feelings about his contributions towards uh, black liberation in Africa and elsewhere. When I was a student in Oxford in the early 70s, I joined the African Society 
and also joined an organization called Movement for Colonial Freedom. That was run by Lord Budby and uh, Fenner Brockway uh, and quite a few others. But I, I had the privilege of meeting Julius Nimweri, Amika Gobel, Jomo Kenyatta, Sekatori, and there's another guy from Mozambique uh, whose name I forgot. Machel. Uh, had... Sorry? Machel, was it? Yes, but Samora Machel, I think his name was. Yes. And we had uh, regular conversations. I was a resident at Oxford on the Africa's role in the liberation from colonial, uh, colonial situation. Um, and Selassie, there were a lot of mixed feelings. Some were very, very pro Selassie uh, because of for historical reason of being conquered and subjugated towards the colonial masters. Yeah. And others felt that he, because he was royalty, he didn't do as much as he ought to and could have done uh, to help in the liber liberation struggles. So like places in Jamaica where he was a seen as a hero. Other parts of the Caribbean country where I was born in Guyana, it was a non-entity completely, and no recognition, all those quite substantial African population descent uh, from slavery uh, and, and sins. Uh, but I do believe that uh, Helen's contribution, the way she portrayed it, I was particularly interested in Sylvia Pankhurst, uh, involvement in this, because I, I, I know a great deal about what Silver Pankers has done, deviating from the normal subject norm, uh, a mother, for example, attitude in terms of politics. And I, I see Silver very much more akin to someone like Rosa Luxemburg, that type of person with a more universal uh, commitment and attachment to liberation, not only of women, but Black people and and people who are experiencing exploitation. So I'm really pleased with what you've done, Helen, and how I wonder whether you are agreeable to attend uh, some Black community groups um, in and around London, people I know who would really welcome your contribution and it give them an opportunity to perhaps put Hale Selassie in a more acceptable way then some people think about him because we, none of us are perfect, we are faults. Much of us have done good as well as some not so good things. But on balance, I think uh, Hal Selassie uh, was a champion. And nevertheless, a lot of black people do follow him and, and, and love him and, and value his contribution. Thanks for listening. Thank you. Yeah, I'm happy to get involved in anything, although I do live in Wales and that Zoom's brilliant because it means what I can go anywhere in the world. Live in Wales. What's wrong with Luton? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that sounds great. And actually listening to you, Jim, it would be really great if you could do a reminiscence session about those days in Oxford when you were in discussion with such luminary um, yes. African leaders. Uh, an activist, so that would be fantastic. Are you, are you up for that then, Jim? Yes, I love it. I've still got my notes from, oh, from the days of attending all these meetings. We didn't have <laughs> computer then, so we had to make physical notes to remind ourselves of what they said. Right, thank you. Now, John, I think you said what you wanted to, even though your hand's still up, so you can take your hand down now, go to reactions and and sort that out. Well, thank you very much indeed. I think that's that, that started a new a new thread of exploration for us, hasn't it? And and Helen, I'd love to talk with you again, um, so that we could bring some of these things together. And I'd love to see the pictures too. So perhaps we can <laughs> you can work on that as one of our resources for our um, unlocking Black history. Um, but we can also in that that resource about Haile Selassie explain that there are different perspectives. Not everybody has the same perspective. So that was great. Thank you very much indeed. And I think now um, we'll go on to, so she, I don't, <laughs> looking around my screen, I can't see you for looking, Christine. Um, Christine's Hi. going to um, look at something which is quite a different perspective. So. We don't always have themes for a whole session. So 
Christine, maybe it's best if you introduce yourself again, because you have a number of responsibilities at Glasgow University, but you're going to talk to us about children, slavery in Scotland in the 18th and 19th century, a long way from home. But introduce yourself first so that we know what roles and responsibilities you have. And have you got a PowerPoint as well? Yes, yes, I've got it. Um, ready, to, ready to go. And yeah, thank you so much for the for the invitation um, to talk to you this lunchtime. And it's been really great to to join in on these conversations. Um, so I'm a. I'll just share this the screen. I'm a lecturer in global history at the University of Glasgow, um, and I also founded there the Beniba Centre for Slavery Studies and that was that kind of came out of an investigation the university did into its how it had profited from slavery and slave trade specifically Caribbean slavery and so we have a number of different kind of reparative justice programs running in partnership with the University of the West Indies at the moment um, and if you go to our website then you can see the the historical research and the report that was written about the university itself and some of the activities that we're doing. But me specifically, my um, primary focus is on the abolition of the slave trade and the abolition of slavery. And I specifically looked at Sierra Leone and Liberia. So my, my PhD was about this very late abolition of slavery in the British Empire, in the protectorate of Sierra Leone, which had been under British rule um, since 1896, but slavery was only legally abolished in 1928. And since then I've worked a bit on some research about forced labor in Liberia. I actually wrote something about the abolition of slavery in Ethiopia. Um, and um, now I'm working on a project that's looking at what happens to children after they're emancipated from the slave trade and from, from slavery. And so um, I wanted to talk this afternoon a little bit about those themes um, about African children who came to Scotland in the 18th and 19th centuries. I'm really sorry, I, I have to leave um, quite sharp at half past one. So I'll try and make this um, relatively brief. I'm actually going to get vaccinated. So it's not an appointment I can even turn up late for. So, um, and yeah, so there are a lot of, um, of course, there are a lot of examples of African children in Scotland um, and in the UK more broadly, because there's of long-standing communities, African communities and communities of African descent. And I mean, I think you know all know Miranda Kaufman's book, um, Black Tudors. Um, so what I'm specifically talking about today is uh, unaccompanied children. So children that came without their families, um, of which there are of course fewer. And I think that looking at unaccompanied children is important for a few different reasons. Um, one is, of course, that it links to the experiences of unaccompanied child migrants in the modern world. So it's where several different kind of systems intersect, the border control system, um, the institutional care system, um, and systems of empire or post-colonial connections. The, the kind of life stories um, that I'm looking at of, of African children and emancipated children connect these histories of slavery, empire and abolition in interesting ways. They played um, significant roles in, um, in, the, in the empire and also in the abolition of slavery. And of course, sort of thinking about unaccompanied children, you're also sort of thinking about the history of institutional care for children. And then I'm also interested in children's experiences. So the experiences obviously of the, of the children that came to Britain and specifically to Scotland, but also of children in Scotland who encountered these children um, and knew their stories. So basically there are three kind of different categories of children, um, unaccompanied children that came to Britain enslaved children, um, wards or apprentices, that's children sent for some kind of training, 
Um, and then this category of rescued children, so children who were redeemed from slavery um, or who were orphaned in war, brought back to Britain by their rescuers. And this is probably a bit of a contested category because, of course, we often only have the account of the rescuer, not the rescuee. And some of these accounts kind of obscure, more coercive um, or colonial politics. And for all of these categories, of course, it's not only unaccompanied African children, uh, Native American children and South Asian children were also brought to Scotland without their um, families. So I can show you an example here. So this is an advertisement placed in September 1765 in the Glasgow Journal seeking um, a runaway Indian lad who had run from his master um, gives a description of what he was wearing and also this unusual feature that one of his eyelashes was white um, and he, that he has slits in each ear about an inch long. A similar advertisement was placed in the east of the country um, for what I assume is the same boy. So again, an Indian boy about 13 years old, um, again, with the white eyelashes um, and a hole cut through each ear. So simultaneously, these kind of advertisements are being placed in 1765 in June and September in Edinburgh and Glasgow looking for this um, same boy. And then a year later, and here we get the extra detail that he's an Indian boy, but not from South Asia. He's a North American Indian boy. So he's an American Indian boy. Um, and now they've, they've taken him up a year in age. So last year they said he was 13. This year they say he's about 14 years old. And again, I do think it's the same boy because of this hair on the eyelids, white, um, this kind of unusual feature. So this was a um, Native American boy brought to, to Scotland who was on the, who escaped from his master um, and they sought him for, for over a year through these newspaper advertisements. Um, and this last advertisement kind of gives the most um, information about him, that he speaks English imperfectly, that he answers to the name of Bob, um, his head is freckled, sort of all these like, sort of details about him. So another example this time from an Indian boy from South Asia. Um, so this is Maharaja Dulip Singh, who's sometimes described as having been rescued or adopted. Um, he was the last Maharaja of the Sikh Empire, and he, he came to power at the age of five with his mother as regent. But he was actually kidnapped by the British Crown and came to Britain at age 15. And he lived for a time near Stirling, in the centre of the country, and then for a while um, in the east in Aberfeldy, Perthshire. Um, and he was only able to return to India twice, like once to visit his mother and the second time for his mother's um, funeral. And he was sort of closely integrated in a way into the royal family, but he was also basically a hostage of the, the British state um, and very much wanted to return to India, but wasn't able to. So his example kind of shows you this, these categories are quite complicated um, and you know, you can have people with very high status um, who are sort of portrayed as being sort of um, rescued or the subject of humanitarianism, but that's not really the what was happening. So to return to African children. So um, the first category enslaved African children were brought to Scotland, often specifically chosen to work as pages or domestic servants in the homes of absentee planters. So these were the wealthy merchants who owned plantations that were worked by enslaved people in the Caribbean. And they could be brought to Europe from as young as three or four years old, either directly from West Africa or from the Caribbean. And we sort of talked a little bit um, two weeks ago, I think it was, about how you sometimes see them in these portraits from the 18th century, although often, um, as in the case of this portrait by Runciman, for example, there's not that much um, known about them. So how did this come about? So this is a letter from a William Calhoun to Archibald Patterson 
in the Glasgow City Archives. William Calhoun was um, serving as a ship's mate um, on a slave ship and Archibald Patterson was his brother-in-law um, married to William's sister. Um, and he writes to him in 1775 from a ship. I have a very fine girl, about 12 years of age. I've had her 18 months with me and she's very smart and will learn anything. Betty will accept her in her home. She can speak good English. So this is an enslaved um, child. He refers to her as being from the Dimbia River, which we, is now called the Scarces River in modern um, day Sierra Leone. And that river was the site of a number of trading networks. So the nearby Ile de Los was the home of numerous um, British traders and slave traders, um, including the infamous Miles Barber. And further south, there was a number of um, Portuguese African families. Um, so Portuguese traders that had settled and married into the um, local trading elites. So this 12-year-old uh, girl that William Colquhoun has enslaved was from that region. So when he says that she can speak good English, she possibly learned that um, in her home, which was close to where these English traders were, or on board the ship um, over the course of that 18 months. So we don't have any more information about what happened after this um, to this girl. So the, the letter was likely written from a ship called the Industry, which was a Bristol based ship. Um, and on that journey to, from West Africa, it went to the upper James River in Virginia. 10% um, of the enslaved people on board the ship had died by the time it reached Virginia in May. Um, and so perhaps she ended up in Virginia, perhaps Betty Ann Patterson and Archibald Patterson took her into their home um, as a servant. So the, these children who were brought to, forcibly brought to Scotland um, through the slave trade and slavery, um, like the, the American Indian child we looked at before, resisted this um, process. So. This is an example of a boy who seems to have been brought directly from West Africa. They call him an African, um, so apologies for the, for the uh, 18th century language, African Negro boy named Boyd. Um, he has a small scar or country mark on the side of his face, which um, is supposed to be a, an indication of African origins, he speaks broken English, um, presumably because he speaks an African language as his first language. And this, so this was an advertisement <clears throat> placed in the Glasgow Journal um, by uh, a Glaswegian master. But children could also be brought um, in slavery from the colonies. So here is a um, boy named James who's been brought um, from the American colony. And this gives quite a detailed <clears throat> description of his outfit, this brown suit of clothes with white metal buttons and carried off some shirts and silk stockings, which he might offer to sale. Um, and so this was a boy presumably working as a valley or, or page. And the advertisement asks that um, he be returned either to the publisher of the newspaper, the Edinburgh Advertiser, or to someone called David Findlay, a hairdresser in Patterson's court. And that is likely not his um, enslaver. It's not the man that brought him from America. Um, or who employed him in Edinburgh. It's often there was a kind of third party chosen as the person to whom um, and runaways um, and slave people would be returned to. So someone who had commercial pre premises um, that are open during the day that they could be brought back to. And then we have this final um, kind of category, I suppose, so this is a boy called Neptune um, who had been serving on a ship and in the advert they specify that he was not enslaved, he was under indenture um, to a merchant at Greenock. Um, so from a, for about seven years from January 1778. But then it says, but as he is an artful fellow, he will give himself out for a free man. So the advertisement is simultaneously saying this boy is not enslaved, um, but he is also not free. So he's under this indenture and he will pretend to be free. 
in order to um, escape from serving on board the ship. And again, like quite a detailed description of the outfits that, um, that Neptune is kind of a, I suppose, probably a kind of amusing nickname for a boy serving as a sailor um, had. So those are kind of different ways in which children came um, to Scotland um, either under indenture or um, as slaves. And as I said, it's not just African children, but children from kind of across the British Empire get caught up in that kind of coercive forcible migration, though far more African children um, than <clears throat> from other places. The second sort of category of children, um, uh, unaccompanied African children in Scotland are um, wards or apprentices. So th these were children that were specifically sent by their um, parents or families in order to get some kind of training or education. Um, and the reasons they would do that is usually sort of elite West African kind of merchant families or political elites. They would want the advantages about British education so their children would be exposed to new economic opportunities, um, to making contacts, networks with um, powerful people, um, and to kind of learn like the cultures of um, business and sort of socialising in Britain. So basically all the reasons that very rich people send their children to boarding school now applied in um, 18th and 19th centuries for these West African elites sending their children to Scotland. And so um, this particular boy, Tom Jenkins, was the son of a Liberian trader, Fanfila Yengi. Fanfila Yengi himself had been a ward or an apprentice um, of another trader. And he then put his son into the um, custody and into the care of a Scottish surgeon called James Swanson, um, who left on the slave ship, the Prudence in 1803. But when they came back to Scotland, uh, Swanson died, sadly. And um, Tom Jenkins, as he was now called, uh, ended up going to school in Hoyk. And he was an extremely talented linguist. So he very quickly learned English, Latin, Greek, and the local dialect of Doric. And when he left school, he applied um, to become a school teacher, but was unsuccessful in that. And he was rejected specifically because he was, because he was black um, by the Church of Scotland. So at that point, an abolitionist group, an anti-slavery group um, intervened and they set him up in his own independent school um, as a school teacher. And he became Britain's first black school teacher. And so there's, there's a great account of his, his life by Alistair Redpath. So of his like, life as a school teacher um, that was in the Hoyk paper a couple of years ago. But what I find interesting about Tom Jenkins is that he, um, even though he's been set up in this, this school and he has the school teacher position, um, he starts writing to different missionary societies saying that he would like to, um, he would like to leave Scotland. And he specifically, he wants to go to either um, San, what he calls Santo Domingo. So the newly independent Black Republic of Haiti, um, or he'd like to go to Liberia, which is where he's from. And as, as we know, um, where there would be an independent state established in 1822. Now, neither of those things happen. And in fact, the, the missionary society he writes to send them to Mauritius, so about as far away from Haiti as you can get. And they send him to Mauritius in 1823. Um, and of course, at, at that time in 1823, slavery was still legal in Mauritius. So Tom becomes a school teacher teaching um, enslaved children and free children um, in Mauritius until slavery is abolished. Um, a decade later. And he establishes this kind of model school in Mauritius. And um, he starts out with six students, he ends up with a um, hundred. And so he really becomes a tremendously successful school teacher. And I think it's a really um, 
kind of significant story, Tom's story, because it sort of straddles the um, straddles the divide between the age of slavery and the age of abolition in terms of so he comes on a slave ship very close to the end of the transatlantic slave trade he himself is never enslaved i mean he's sent kind of as, as an elite but then he ends up um an unaccompanied child because his guardian james swanson dies um he's rejected by the church of scotland because of his race and yet somehow um ends up as this tremendously successful mission school teacher in Mauritius. So that brings me to um, this kind of final category of, of unaccompanied African children, and that's these rescued or um, children who've been redeemed from slavery. And so this is um, one example, Salim Aga. And Salim Aga was actually purchased, so like redeemed in the sense of bought as a slave, specifically in order to emancipate him. Um, by Robert Thurburn, who's the British consul in Alexandria. And he'd actually been born in Sudan, but enslaved and trafficked to Egypt, where Thurburn had um, discovered him. And Thurburn sent him to live outside Aberdeen and Peter Coulter um, when he was about 10 years old. And um, Salim Aga was sort of a Renaissance man. So he, he wrote an account of his life. He wrote um, some poetry about Scotland. He gave lectures about the, the Nile and about Egypt um, at the Great Exhibition in London. Um, he was an explorer who traveled with William Bakey, a Scottish um, doctor up the River Niger. Um, and he collected objects which are now in the Liverpool World Museum. So, so he was quite a kind of um, the sort of adventurous um, life sort of almost living the life of a kind of British colonial um, explorer and adventure, but he had started out as an enslaved um, Sudanese child. Um, and then the final child I wanted to talk a little bit about. So this is um, a gravestone in, a music, in a graveyard in Edinburgh called the Grange Cemetery. And so the text reads, Tom, an African slave boy, died at Edinburgh um, on April 19th, 1884, age 13. And again, this word redeemed with the precious blood of Christ, erected by children of the Rose Hall United Presbyterian Church. And Tom um, had been brought from the present day Congo uh, by this man, uh, Joseph Clark, who was a missionary in the regions beyond missionary union. Now, neither of those children are Tom. I, I don't think, I don't 100% know who those children are, but I'm fairly sure they're not Tom. But they are the first two students at the Congo Institute in Colwyn Bay in um, Wales, or the, two of the first students, um, which I think you know a little bit about, this institute set up by William Hughes to train African missionaries. And so Joseph Clark was part of the, the regions beyond missionary union, which was established by the, by the wealthy brewing family, the, the Guinnesses, Henry Grattan Guinness, who was a nephew of the founder of the, the Guinness empire as it were. And the regions beyond missionary union established uh, the Livingston Inland Mission to work in the Congo in 1877. And um, their first permanent mission, the Palabala mission, you can see sort of just inland on the Congo River there, um, established by the missionary Henry Craven. And it was at mission, mission stations like that that they had sort of attracted and recruited emancipated um, slave children. And so this is uh, one of them, Bateku. So he's the one that's standing on the right dressed in this white <laughs> outfit. And he gave this um, account to the missionaries of this really traumatic journey through slavery of like passing through multiple hands being sold on until he came <clears throat> to live um, in the mission station. So why did were children like this brought, brought to Scotland is the question. Um, I think, or my argument is one very important reason is so that they could act as interpreters 
And so they were brought to Britain to learn English um, well enough to be able to um, work with the missionaries to teach their native African languages, to write grammars and dictionaries. Here, one, um, one of them named Lembo is at work with a girl named Raku, and he's working, um, creating a, a dictionary together. So I think this is like a large reason why the, the children were brought um, back to Britain um, and why sort of these two children um, here pictured with Joseph Clark um, ended up in, in it having their photograph taken in Aberdeen in this photograph. Um, oh, and here they are the two children with Joseph Clark um, with the first four students of the Colwyn Bay Institute. You can see standing with them is Frank, and that was Frank Tiva Clark, um, and he joined that first mission station, um, and he was redeemed from slavery by Joseph Clark sometime before 1885 and spent some time in Glasgow training, um, training in mechanics before he returned to the Ikoko mission um, with his adopted sister, Vunga or Lena Clark. So Frank, Lena um, and Tom, whose gravestone we saw at the beginning were three kind of adoptive siblings adopted by the, the Clarks and they all spent some time in Edinburgh at their house. And Frank and Lena Clark went on to become very significant in the Congo reform movement and were assistants to Roger Casement giving testimony about the atrocities um, happening in Leopold's Congo. And so it's a kind of extraordinary web of sort of anti-slavery, um, uh, missionizing, and then this, this brief time together sort of creating this family in, in Edinburgh. Um, that sort of can then connects Tom, Lena and Frank sort of in the in the field in the Congo. So thank you. Well, Go thank you. That was here. absolutely fascinating. Gosh, that was really, really interesting. Oh, thank you. We've looked in Wales, as you know, um, I'm uh, I've been based in Wales. We've looked at the stories of um, African um, young people who've been brought into Wales. And of course, with the, the story um, of the African Institute or Congo House, um, and those that's a photograph of the, the boys, but you've got a photograph and they're more grown up. And that's really interesting, isn't it? So, uh, and then in, in this book, there are the stories of what happened to, to those young men and many of them, there, were, uh, there was only one girl, I think. Um, so there's a complete listing of the, the students and what they went on to do. So we want to do some more research on that. Oh, Christine, that was fascinating. Now, I know you need to go any moment, but if there's any burning questions, I think David's going to uh, I, Sorry. Uh, I, I, I can send an email to Christine or... Uh, oh, sorry. Did, did you have any questions, Christine? No, no, no. Yes. Yeah, no, sorry. Ahead. I thought uh, Liz was inviting questions. I can send an email uh, to Christine with a few links just out of interest. I'm not a historian, but uh, taking the young uh, Sikh boy who was in Scotland, mm. uh, I think one of his daughters or sisters or nieces uh, is, uh, has uh, been exhibited in the Museum of London, uh, Princess Sophia Duleep Singh, who uh, was linked to Queen Victoria. And uh, she was a, a suffragette. So if you, I can give you a contact to the Museum of London who can, yeah. you know, dish up the reference for that so could, that will link to the young boy That's uh, and uh, Liz mentioned the Congo context and, and mm -hmm. on this uh, lunchtime conversation Chief Thomas Bikabi from Congo uh, Councillor uh, Gwyneth Kensler uh, know quite a bit about the Congo Institute and there's a 
a graveyard in the woods near Colwyn Bay, where eight of the young uh, Congolese boys uh, were buried. And uh, the Cong Congolese embassy in London ca uh, came to do plates and uh, to, to note that. And, and this, I, I can send you some information about unaccompanied children research, but modern day, which may interest you, yeah. because uh, we've got a, an Albanian organization uh, in, in London, a community organization that deals with 165 unaccompanied children. So just comparing the, the research of the modern day, that might interest you. There's a, an academic at UCL in London who's worked with these young children. Anyway, I've said enough because you have to rush and Liz has to close. Thank you. Well, I'm just going to allow David to, to, to ask his question. It's okay. I mean, I, I can get in touch with Christine and I think it's important she gets vaccinated. So. I think so. <laughs> I mean, this week, Christine, so... Uh, <laughs> well, thank you very much indeed, Christine. That was absolutely fascinating. Absolutely fascinating. Oh, thank you so much, thank you so much, Helen. That was just wonderful to hear yeah. that story of um, His Imperial Majesty told so clearly and succinctly. Thank you very much indeed for that. And thank you for all the questions and comments. And a special thank you to Sibani for joining us today. Sibani Thank Roy, you, Liz. Thank well, you for all your help. Yeah, that, the North Wales um, Association for Multicultural Integration, NUAMI. Um, with other other names too, and Sibani has been a great support for us as we've been doing the research and the work in Colwyn Bay about the African Institute. So uh, thank you, Sibani, for being with us. Bye, everyone. Thanks so much. Thank you. I have to run now. <laughs> Please email me with any questions. Like, yeah, it'd be great. <laughs> Bye. Thanks, Liz. Do you want me to stay on? Do you need to talk to me? Unless we can catch up. Are you going to switch the recording off, Simon?